All right, welcome everybody. Here's the Slido code. Oops. Let's try it again. Welcome everybody. Is that working in the back? Welcome everyone. Is can someone is Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Okay. Um Towards the end, there was a good question about uh, the uh, liberalism and how liberalism is connected to slavery or justifies slavery. Is it really true that liberalism justifies slavery? And it's a good question, and I didn't uh, explain it especially well. And I hope the discussion of Haiti today will help us understand what um, sort of the Jeffersonian position is, the position of the Democratic Republicans, and the way it, it contributes to the uh, entrenchment of slavery in the 18, really from 1794 forward. But to do that, we actually have to start, we have to understand the largest slave revolt in the world. And that takes place in Saint-Domingue, a French colony, and has everything to do with the revolution. Um, Okay, but some background. Can you explain the due dates for packback during after spring break? Oh, thank you. So there are no, there is no packback during spring break. So nothing due uh, Monday or Wednesday. Um, the packback will be will continue basically after spring break. Okay. And I'm going to try to keep doing putting this. Oops, what did I do? Oh, something about chapter nine. Sorry. There's a question about chapter nine. Uh, buh, 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 buh. All right, let me just take a quick look at the syllabus here. We are, yes, we are going to have a quiz at the end of class. So many questions. Oh, <laughs> where can I access oceans of grain? Thanks. Uh, well, and now my word is frozen. This is going to be an excellent day, I have to say. Uh, the book Oceans of Grain actually is, um, it's at Amazon. It's also, I think, at the, book, the Five Points uh, bookstore, Avid bookstore, uh, and it should be available from Basic Books as well. Thanks. Uh, all right. More questions. So many questions. There's just one chapter due this week. That's correct. Yes, you can use anything for chapters eight and nine for uh, the pack pack. Uh, the grades for pack pack are coming. I just need to import them. Okay. And again, we are having a quiz at the end of the class. All right, remember again, the Jeffersonian Republicans uh, supported small land holdings, uh, or tended to be people with small land holdings. Uh, their policy really was cheap land in the West. Uh, they believed in democracy, but really for white men. Uh, they tended to support the French, and they opposed the Alien and Sedition Act. We talked a little bit about land prices and how that becomes a, an issue for Jefferson. And Jefferson basically makes it a campaign promise to lower land prices, and he does that. That's right, chapter eight and nine aren't due until the week after spring break. Right, so you can do chapter seven, I think. I can't open up Word on my laptop alongside OBS, alongside PowerPoint, so I can't say for sure uh, what the assignment is for the syllabus. All right.
after the French Revolution. Um, it's initially uh, white and then black, um, free blacks in, so not, uh, uh, black men and women who are not enslaved in Saint-Domingue who start to demand their rights in the French colony of Saint-Domingue. Um, by 1791, uh, when the, during the revolution, uh, they proclaim, many enslaved people uh, proclaim their own uh, freedom. And Toussaint Lavache emerges as a leader of this group of revolutionaries. He doesn't actually support the revolution at first. He first moves his uh, wife and children. He is himself formerly uh, enslaved. But he moves his wife and children to Santo Domingo, which is the Spanish side of that island. And he sides with the revolutionaries in 1792 and maintains a line of forts separating uh, what becomes the revolutionary territory, where black people have basically ended slavery on their own, and colonial territory. There's a question about how many quizzes we've had so far. So far, uh, we're behind. We've only had the second quizzes today. All right, 247207. And again, I'd hope to be able to show this at the same time. But The French army is, so, and then in 1794, the French revolutionary government accepts the abolition of slavery. And at this point, Toussaint uh, fights off Spanish and British invaders who try to take advantage of the uh, revolution that's taking place in Saint-Domingue to reestablish slavery and take the valuable colony. In 1798, um, Wabashe signs treaties with both the Britain and the US. And around 1800, as Napoleon uh, comes to power, he has uh, much larger plans. Uh, bear with me for a second here. The French are fighting a war with England at this time, from 1790s uh, up until uh, 1800. Napoleon Bonaparte had become the Emperor of France. He assumed control in the closing years of the French Revolution. At first, the major theater of war was in India. Uh, which Napoleon wanted to take from the British. But his plans fall through when <laughs> his ally, Tsar Paul, is betrayed by his own son and strangled by an assassin. Bonaparte is stuck without an ally. The only place left to go to expand, as uh, Bonaparte sees it, is to go to New Orleans. He buys back New Orleans and the territory west of the Mississippi from Spain in 1800. He promised Britain and the United States that he would end the slave revolt. And he planned to establish his hegemony over the central part of the American continent by controlling the French port on the Mississippi. And this is, this is, uh, sorry. Uh, I need a better map. Bear with me for a second. All right, it's, it's this uh, yellow territory west of the Mississippi that Louisiana claims, and that's his plan. Um, the attraction of the Mississippi River Valley, though, its long-term value is, is pretty clear, but its short-term value is that Napoleon can establish a kind of tap on trade uh, in the American colonies, because as the American colonies are sort of expanding into the Ohio River Valley, all of their external trade has to go through New Orleans. Let me step back a little bit. If you're in Cincinnati or Cleveland or Pittsburgh and you want to trade with the East, the way to trade is not by sending goods uh, up the Ohio River. It's not by going directly East, as you would think. It's actually by sending goods down the Ohio River, down the Mississippi River, around the Gulf of Mexico, up the Atlantic Ocean, and to Boston. Does that make sense? <laughs> That's how you say Why? Because it's actually cheaper that way. 40, uh, 40 miles 
of overland traffic is 40 miles of overland traffic will eliminate the value of almost anything that you carry over that distance. The cost to deliver something 40 miles over land is so expensive that unless you have gold or uh, ivory or something like that, uh, it's, it's, just too, it's just too expensive to travel. Waters, it, the friction in water is so low that sending goods by uh, river and bateau all the way around is much, much cheaper. That means that the pinch point for the United States is still New Orleans. Right? And the Mississippi River, control of Mississippi River, is potentially still in the hands of the French after they bought it back. Napoleon buys it back. Does that make sense? So Pittsburgh communication and Cleveland's communications, Cincinnati's communication with the East depends ultimately on that travel all the way around. Now, uh, by the 1820s, uh, New York is going to open the Erie Canal. And the Erie Canal is going to allow you to go from the Great Lakes to the east. But until then, all that traffic has to go all the way around. Does that make sense? Yes? So you said it was cheaper to go the Mississippi route than go the Atlantic route? Is that what you said? No, it's cheaper to go down the Mississippi, through the Gulf of Mexico, back up the Atlantic, and over <laughs> to an American port than it is to go directly east. Even though it's much, much closer to go directly east, it's much, much cheaper to go all the way around. Okay, and that's why control of the New Orleans is so important, because uh, what what Napoleon understands is he can tax all the goods that pass through New Orleans, right? And so communication between the back, back country and the East is going to be going to be under his control. Uh, who fought French troops in 1802? Who didn't fight French troops in 1802? <laughs> uh, France, at this point, in the, in the period uh, after the French Revolution, you have the Napoleonic Wars, and Napoleon is fighting everyone. He's overturning uh, uh, autocratic states, I suppose, imperial states um, in uh, Germany, in the Netherlands, in... Uh, uh, the Napoleonic Wars basically take over almost all of Europe in this period. So France is fighting everyone uh, in this period. But his hope for expansion is ultimately uh, depends on New Orleans. The problem is that New Orleans and that whole region had been traditionally, for France, the attraction for this region had been to, f to support Saint-Domingue as a slave colony. The slave uprising that takes place in 1794, that's, that's the French Revolutionary Assembly, supports Napoleon wants to overturn. And he sends the largest army to cross the Atlantic uh, ever up until this point, 35,000 troops to land in New Orleans. But the plan is to stop in Saint-Domingue first and reimpose slavery. He doesn't say that. He's not explicit about that, but his secret orders to his generals are to reimpose slavery in Saint-Domingue. <laughs> if Goodreads gave Oceans of Grey in 505, why did the Wall Street Journal dislike it so much? He, didn't li he liked it, actually. I, he thought I was um, pushing the argument a little strong, but it was it's actually a positive review. Uh, I was super excited with the Wall Street Journal review. Okay. So let's think about, so uh, it's a multinational force of German, French, and Polish mercenaries that uh, Napoleon sends over. Many of them are committed to the ideals of the French Revolution. Their mission is to establish France's military dominance in America, but their first stop is Saint-Domingue. The black revolutionaries in Saint-Domingue who proclaimed their own freedom were to be quickly overthrown. They thought of Toussaint Lavache as a savage uh, and that slaves could be easily put down by their battle-scarred troops. These are troops that um, uh, had been, some of them are revolutionaries like the Poles, uh, others are basically um, uh, mercenaries like the Germans or some of the Germans. Uh, and these people had been through conflicts in Europe. The expectation was they would easily put down uh, the Toussaint Lavache's men. And indeed, the French army is perhaps the most able army on the earth, veterans of numerous campaigns in Europe. Toussaint Lavache sees in 1802 
86 white sails on the horizon as this fleet arrives to reestablish slavery on, uh, in, in Saint-Domingue. Friends, he said, he, he cried and he said, friends, we are doomed. All of France has come. Let us at least show ourselves worthy of our freedom. Now the Haitian army was not uh, the Haitian army of today. Sorry, uh, Napoleon's soldiers' question was, were made up of German, French, and who? That's German, French, and uh, Poles. 247207. Again, just to remember. Toussaint Lavache destroys the French plans for the Americas and makes it possible for the United States to expand west. Let me talk about how that happens. In many ways, Toussaint's war against uh, the French invaders is very much like Washington's war against the British invaders. The French conquered most of the important coastal towns uh, and harbors, but they kept facing opposition in the countryside in the same way that the British did with Washington. At the French siege of Fort Perrault, uh, in March of 1802, it's successful, but cost more than 1,500 um, French troops. And where is Perrault? My knowledge of Haitian geography, uh, it's near Port-au-Prince, but I can't say for precisely where it is. Um, one French Republican general recalled the weird silence among his troops, though, when they heard the black defenders of the fort singing French patriotic and revolutionary songs. Are they right? Are we um, really the... Uh, you know, who, who's the invader here? Who are the revolutionaries here? They believe themselves to be revolutionaries, and yet, um, as they see it, they wonder whether uh, Napoleon's army is doing the right thing. But in many ways, this was not like the American Revolution. When General Rochambeau took, uh, reached Fort Liberté, uh, he found that Toussaint Labaché had ordered it burned to the ground. In retaliation, Rochambeau immediately began mass executions of all black men, women, and children. The Bay of Manseville was turned red with the blood of ex-slaves and mulattoes, as they called them. They died calling out, away with the whites, away with slavery. Napoleon's officers grew more vicious as his plans for New Orleans seemed to be unraveling. The plan was basically just to stop here for a couple of weeks and reestablish slavery, but it takes months of trying to uh, regain control of this region. He ordered all the freed slaves of Haiti to be re-enslaved, and all white women who had ever had relations with uh, black San Domingans to be sent to France, where they would be considered prostitutes. To discourage attacks, um, the um, French would tie people together on boats, on little boats, and put them in the harbor, put little holes in them so that they would drown slowly, screaming. Others would be forced to dig their own graves and be hanged over them. And this is what the uh, French are increasingly doing. It just becomes a more, much more vicious and much more kind of horrible war than the American Revolution in terms of um, the, the conflict. Toussaint had two things on his side. One was a superior knowledge of tactics, and the second was yellow fever. He surprised his uh, the French generals with uh, a, a bunch of tactical uh, advantages that, that Washington himself had used, including uh, raids at night and feigned skirmishes where he would move his soldiers in a way uh, to, to persuade the French general that he, that he was moving one way and then move another. By 1803, within a year, less than one-third of Napoleon's troops remained alive. Some of the Polish members of the French army then switched sides and joined the sides of um, the people in Saint-Domingue, and the remaining tr French troops were rounded up and killed. Uh, and this is in part because in 1803, I have PowerPoint in two places here. 
just to make things complicated. Where's my... In 1802, um, uh, sorry, in 1802, he is tricked and captured in 1803. Uh, he dies in the French prison. His men continue to fight, um, and ultimately, Napole uh, Napoleon gives up. In a fit of pique, he goes to James Madison, emissary of America, and offers to sell him the middle part of America for $15 million. And this takes place immediately after he has learned that his army has failed in San Domingue. Louisiana Purchase that allows the US to expand into this region that uncorks the Mississippi by making New Orleans no longer a, an external port that you have to pay a tax to, um, we can thank, or the United States can thank, uh, Toussaint Wavache that that conflict, this bitter conflict that ultimately defeats 35,000 French troops is what allows um, the Louisiana Purchase to take place. And it's this that changes the character of American liberalism in many ways. It's this that changes the, it makes it possible. So remember it's in 1800 and then in 1804 that this new land ordinances are passed under Washington and it's beginning after 1804 that this land is opened up. Initially when Lewis and Clark move across uh, this landscape to survey it, to try to figure out where the hell the Pacific is, because nobody is quite sure if there's a route to the Pacific uh, over water. And it's Eli Whitney's cotton gin that uh, ensures that the, if, we're, if we talk about an external market, an abstract market, that abstract market is increasingly uh, heading towards um, uh, cotton. Who sold Louisiana to the U.S.? Napoleon sold uh, uh, Louisiana to the United States. In fact, it's the first bank of the United States that has to figure out how to pay France off as quickly as possible, um, and, and it it's, uh, creates a, a, a debt in the United States that will be paid off over time. Why is the Louisiana Purchase so important is a question. The Louisiana Purchase is so important because it uncorks the Mississippi because it makes the Mississippi part of the, uh, it makes New Orleans part of the United States and makes the Mississippi River, which is this crucial artery for the United States, um, uh, open as a free port. So that trade can travel down the Mississippi River. I thought Napoleon sold it to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, no, Napoleon sold it to the United States. James Madison was the person who uh, worked it out. Jefferson at that point was back in the United States. So he did sell it to the president. Uh, Thomas Jefferson did accept the purchase, but it was James Madison who was in uh, Paris at the time. Which America? Okay. Who will use the Mississippi River now that it's open? Uh, Americans will use the Mississippi River. It will become an American port. Now, bringing... New Orleans and what becomes Louisiana, which is uh, the west side of the Mississippi River into the United States, is a complicated business. Uh, Louisiana is already a French colony. It already has its own laws, which are different from the United States. And um, this is complicated because the French system, um, and it, that system still exists in Louisiana today, uh, is very different about how it treats families, for example. And the French system emphasized family interests, whereas American and British uh, common law emphasized uh, the, the authority and power of individual men. This meant that you, if you were the illegitimate child of a wealthy man, and you could prove that you were the illegitimate child of, the, of a wealthy man, and that man died, you could claim a portion of his fortune. The point was not to leave any bastards outside of this, this system. That meant that biracial men whose fathers were enslavers and who mo whose mothers were uh, slaves were themselves, in some cases, large property owners in New Orleans and had the rights of citizens in this French system. The French recognized wives as contractual partners. 
and limited uh, disinheritance. So, um, uh, whereas in the United States and in Britain, the uh, woman's uh, rights were merged under the husband's authority. In France in, and, and in the French colony of Louisiana and what becomes the American state of Louisiana, there's no, um, uh, it's possible to, bastards themselves can receive um, uh, a portion of the inheritance. Yes, we bought it for 10 million. Okay. Finally, the U.S. recognizes what's called the Digest of Civil Laws, which is modeled on the Code Napoleon, which is an attempt to sort of, um, you know, modernize these uh, languages. And so, if even today, if you go to Louisiana and you want to practice law, there's a whole different set of uh, basic laws that you have to understand and um, and become familiar with. And property is uh, much more complicated. It, it creates in New Orleans, a place and a kind of status for biracial men and women who are descended from slaveholders. Those people could be disinherited in the Ameri the, much of the rest of the Americas, but not in New Orleans. Uh, the 15 million is in um, the money at the time, not in today's dollars. Okay, so Louisiana was a, a third kind of slave society that was quite different from uh, the South Carolina rice plantations or the Virginia tobacco plantations. It was formed partly from escaped uh, enslavers, free blacks, and uh, slaves who left uh, Saint-Domingue and were some of whom were re-enslaved in the American colony of Louisiana. And so we see a much more different syncretic religious tradition uh, this is where jazz, this is in one way the birthplace of jazz. It's a birthplace, very different kind of music, uh, voodoo and other uh, religious traditions that are kind of mix of African and French Catholic traditions uh, emerge in uh, New Orleans and Louisiana. Okay, I talked already about Eli Whitney. I won't go over that again. But what we see then in the what, what Jefferson hoped and what Jefferson got were very different things. What Jefferson hoped was that by leaving things to the market and allowing people to expand into the West and by ensuring that, there were, that you could buy a small amount of property, uh, 160 acres instead of 640 acres, a relatively small piece of property, um, the hope was that there would be lots of independent yeoman farmers who would, uh, non-slaveholding farmers, that would emerge and they would grow wheat for international markets. What actually happens is that enslavers from Virginia and South Carolina and even from Saint-Domingue settle in this region and they buy up the land uh, at, at uh, relatively low prices. They have gold and silver and access to credit that many other small farmers uh, don't have. And so while the, this vision that Jefferson has of lots of cheap land in the West is supposed to make a kind of paradise or utopia for small uh, white farmers, what it actually becomes is an entrenchment of the slave regime in the West, the expansion and the consolidation of uh, the uh, slave regime. So that we see just uh, a thousand families or so actually eight or nine hundred families along the Mississippi River that control the vast majority of the property uh, that own people and that are producing uh, cotton for an international market. Louisiana is a third slave region. If we think about the, the, the kind of culture hearths of slavery, one culture hearth is rice, right? Which is, you know, uh, uh, lots of black people living together, a much more Afro, uh, uh, African traditions preserved. In Virginia, we see tobacco, which is more kind of Afro-British, and it's uh, complicated, and you have a broad marriages, and you have uh, people often, families often separated. In Louisiana, you have something different. This becomes uh, the center of a cotton production and also uh, sugar production, and it's a much more kind of French uh, society in complicated ways. Who settled instead of farmers? The people who settled instead of farmers were 
Former slaves, mostly the children of former slaveholders, sorry, the children of slaveholders, who would travel by boat with bags of gold, literally bags of gold, and buy up that western land that was available uh, because of the Louisiana Purchase. Does that make sense? So it was supposed to have been settled by farmers. And there are some farmers who do get land in this region, but it's much of it is dominated by slaveholders. Bear with me here for a second. All right. Um, I think rather than talking about... Um, the conflict over uh, Indian removal and I issues about the red sticks and things like that. I'd like to switch gears and do the quiz now. So I will make that available on ELC just to give people enough time to do that. Oh, that's a good question. Why don't other states that were part of Louisiana territory like Arkansas and Missouri have French inspired legal systems? And in part that's because they're not settled as uh, formal territories. There were there were people in St. Louis. Um, there were people in Bayou Booth and and no Bayou Booth's in the Louisiana side. There were people in 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 and around Arkansas, but there weren't enough of them to um, uh, sort of have their own government in the French system. And what happens is, is the whole French system of government that exists in the Louisiana Territory, which is part of the French um, Empire, becomes part of the United States. Okay. Oh. Only took 15 minutes for word to start up there. Let me just look at the dates here. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, March 2nd. Right, so it's 7 and 8. <laughs> okay. This, this is going to be a long day. All right, uh, let me open up ELC. Okay, I'm actually going to stop displaying. Uh, well, all right, I'll keep displaying for a second. Just to make everything more complicated. All right. Tools, quizzes. <coughs> All right, and take a look and see if you can access the quiz before I log off Twitch entirely. Can you guys see the quiz? Awesome. Okay. See you guys on Friday. Thanks again. And, and uh, if I don't see you before, then have a great spring break.